My name is Amy Palmero Winters, and I am out of Long Island, New York, here in the United States. I am an ultra endurance athlete who essentially turned ultra endurance athlete because of the paths that my life had presented for me at a young age. Tell me more about your childhood. Were you quite sporty growing up? So as kids, it was me and my two older brothers. We had nothing else to do but be outside, be sporty, be adventurous, and just be athletic because that's essentially all that we had. We lived on 114 acres. And back in the day when you were a kid, your mother and father told you to get out of the house after breakfast or lunch and told you not to come back till dinner or not to come back till it was time to get a bath and go to bed. Did you enjoy like the outdoors or was it more like a punishment? Like, oh no, I've got to go outside and run around on these 114 acres. As children, all we ever wanted to do was be outside. So it was not a punishment at all. I know nowadays with children, it almost seems like a punishment and it's saddening to me as a parent to see other children who don't want to play outside or who don't know what to do when they go outside. Because as children, all of us, all that we ever knew was go outside, go play. And to be honest with you, that's all we ever wanted to do. As soon as we got up in the morning, if we had chores, if we had anything that had to be done, we got up, got it done. So all we could do is just go outside and play. And we didn't come back. We didn't need snacks. We didn't need drinks of water. We didn't need anything until it was either time for dinner, but that was because we were made to come in and sit down and wash up for dinner, or you were made to come in at dark and it was time to wash up and go to bed. Otherwise, you wouldn't see any of us. We would, we would literally be gone for the entire day on the property, just doing, having adventures, you name it. And it was an amazing childhood. When did running start to become a bigger part of your life? Running for me has always been a big part of my life. It started when I was a young child. And that's just because when we had family picnics, we would have family picnics. You didn't have PlayStations and everything else. You didn't have picnics with party bags and gift bags. You had picnics where you did three-legged races, where you did burlap bag sack races where you teamed up with somebody and did wheelbarrow races. Everything was physically um, performed when you were a kid. So running was just a part of everything that we did. And running was something that no matter your economic status, whether you were rich or you were poor or you were poor, you could run. You could put on a pair of shoes. You didn't have to wear shoes. Whether you had shoes, no shoes, good shoes, bad shoes, running was something that you could do no matter the funding that you had. And so for me, it was just something that naturally came about, number one, because of our lifestyle, but number two, because we didn't have the financial means to be involved in any other athletic events. So I want to say I started running when I was probably four or five years old. I remember entering my first race when I was eight years old. What happened after high school? Did you want to go on to college? Were you starting to take your running more more seriously? You know, what was the next steps? So for me, unfortunately, I never took anything seriously. And that was something that drove my dad crazy all the time. He would always you know, get on my case about giving your best effort and and really doing your best at everything that you did. And so for me in high school, I would focus on, you know, if I was running the 300 meter hurdles, I would cross the finish line and, and win, win districts and be headed off to states or set a new um, high school record. But then the 800 meters that was to follow it, I would just jump around and goof off and wave to everybody as I was running down the track and cross the finish line in second place with the girl just ahead of me because I guess my focus wasn't there. And and I know it drove my dad crazy. So for me, as we were growing up, all of that kind of played together when it came time for college. We didn't have the financial security um, in going to college. So I remember accepting 
uh, an entry to Youngstown State University. And the day that I started, I showed up at cross country practice, told the coach, give me a shot, went out and did the 3.1 mile run, came back and he gave me a scholarship. Um, And for me, this scholarship definitely encompassed a lot of the financial burden, but there were certain things that it didn't encompass. And that was something that as a family, we just couldn't afford. So after my first year, I remember my mother saying to me, you know, you don't have to go back if you don't want to, because we really can't afford it. And that kind that kind of thing always plays for me on my heartstrings because I want to be able and have always wanted to be able to do what's best for my family. And it was at that time that I actually uh, dropped out of college and started working full time to support myself. But did I ever... I never really knew the type of athlete that I was and kind of continued on into that, basically, for a lack of better terms, half-assed focus on running. I remember running with my friend. We were running three to four miles every few days a week. And a friend of mine, her father, he was a marathon runner, and he had said to me, you know, you, you got to start running with us. So I would run with them every once in a while. And he was joking and said, I bet you can't run a marathon. And I asked him, obviously, what's a marathon? He told me it was 26.2 miles. And I was like, no problem. I can do that. And he, and he said, okay. And I said, when? And he's like, next week. And I said, all right. You know, for me, it was all about, okay, you know, whatever you ask me to do, I'll do it. I know I can do it. It's all about just determination and effort and I'll get through it. We ran that first marathon in three hours and 24 minutes. My friend was, my friend and his friends, they were lawyers and insurance salesmen in our local town. They were all just baffled because here I was, no training, no distance running, half-assed, went out and ran a marathon, and my first time qualified for Boston, which was something that they had been doing their entire running careers. So we took that next step, went off, ran the Boston Marathon, and that's kind of what opened up the door for me in longer distance running. And it was a year later when I was hit by a car, when I was out riding my motorcycle, that led to a three-year struggle and fight to save my leg, which resulted in a below-the-knee amputation of my left leg. Oh my goodness. I mean, my jaw is on the floor about the, you know, the no training, you know, having running with your friend, you know, these three, four mile runs. And then, you know, a week later going out and running a marathon, 26.2 miles in three hours, 24 minutes. That is just an insane time. Like, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Like, oh my goodness. And then, to qualify for Boston, to get into longer distance running and then to be in that accident and then to have your dreams and to, well, I'm assuming like your dreams crushed and then to go through the, the trauma of losing your leg. Like, how was that recovery process the three years after? Like, did you ever think that you'd be able to get back to running? Was that a dream of yours or did you think it was all over? Well, for me, when I had had the accident, it was... It was very surreal at the time. I had no clue what was going on. I was in so much pain and my body is very unique. And I think and I think a lot of people's bodies do the same thing. Well, I know for a fact that all of us go into shock. Whenever we have that much pain, our bodies go into shock. But when my body goes into shock, I have the tendency to start laughing and giggling and because I'm hyper-focused on what's going on around me what do people think of me? I don't know why, but I was worried about crying because I would—I didn't want anybody to see me and think that I was weak. So as I laid there on the ground after the accident, we were waiting for the ambulance to come. And I just remember, don't cry. I remember giggling. I remember saying I was okay. It was no big deal. It was just a you know broken foot, broken leg, whatever it was. I'd be off to the hospital. And at that time, I was working as a furnace operator at a local carbide plant. For me, 
I was so proud of my job and the fact that I was a female doing the job of three employees. I was able to lift trays of carbide and utilize the centering machines that utilize computer programs and essentially do the work of three employees all by myself. I worked at the time anywhere from 12 to 24 to 48 hour shifts. So for me, I was so proud of the job that I was doing, the laborious skills that I had, that as I laid there, I was worried about what am I going to do? I have to be to work tomorrow at 6 a.m. So the ambulance picked me up, took me to the hospital. My mom and dad were called. So for me, as I laid there in the emergency room, the nurses and the doctors would kept they kept coming back and forth, looking at me. Um, I was in tremendous amounts of pain. The doctor would come in, shake his head, look at me, walk out. After about five or six hours, my mother finally grabbed him and said, look, what is, what's going on? Why is my daughter in so much pain? And here, what they were waiting for was for another hospital to accept, accept my case. Because the hospital where I was at in my hometown, the only alternative was to cut my leg off because the damage was so severe, it had crushed my entire lower leg. And the damage was so severe that all they knew to do was amputate. So all they were doing was, tr- was just hoping and praying that somebody else would take on the case. And I remember the doctor walked in with, the clipboard in hand with the paperwork for my mother to authorize the amputation of my leg. And just at that time, one of the nurses, the ER nurses came running in who was a friend of my mother's and, you know, just like put the halts to everything and did an emergency stop and said a local pits, a local hospital Pittsburgh was sending a helicopter and they were on their way. And it was then essentially that started that three year journey into saving my leg, my left leg from an amputation. Um, And for me, I remember kind of fading in and out for the first two months of all, I stayed in, in the Pittsburgh hospital for two months and had countless, countless numbers of surgeries finalized by an entire flap graft of the entire portion of my right forearm along with a vein and an artery put into my foot. And I remember doctors saying that I would never walk. I'll never run again. They said, you'll never run again. You'll walk and you'll walk with a limp, but at least you'll, you'll have your foot. And for me, my focus then still turned towards my work. And I think that it did that because it gave me a goal to achieve. So my focus was my work and getting back to work. And then from there, it just kept progressing forward. I had to have multiple surgeries because the foot continued to atrophy and the bones continued to break away. So it was years of removal of internal bones in the foot and pins and plate plates. And then with every surgery, it was a goal. And then I got to the point where the pain and the lack of function was so great that my only alternative was to have the foot removed. And I remember for me, it's essentially closing one door and opening another. And as odd as it was, the closing of that door was done with the completion of a marathon. So there I was with my foot. It went from a size seven and a half. It was about a size four. It was so malformed in shape. Um, All the bones were gone out of my toes. My ankle was fused. My Achilles was locked. And I remember doing the Columbus Marathon on that foot the way it was as a means of closing that door. And I remember it was unbelievably painful, but it was what I needed to get to that next level. And from there, it was, again, multiple surgeries with failed attempts at amputation, um, the internal 
tissue and bones didn't survive. And so it was several, several amputations followed by the next journey in life that was to seek out a team of prosthetists who could match up to my ability levels and allow me to perform and achieve all the goals and dreams that I had now set out ahead of me as I opened that next door. How old were you when the amputation happened? I was 21 years old when the amputation happened. 21 years. Wow. How did you get through that time period? Did we, were you seeing counsellors? Were you, were you able to speak to any people? Was, were you able to process that at that age? Or is it, or is it only sort of later on in life that, that you've come to terms with it? To be honest with you, I, I never was able to seek out counselling um, just because, and, and I honestly, I, I struggle with that today. For some reason, my mind did not, and it still will not allow that therapy just to get in there and prob- probably allow someone to get in my head and teach me the proper ways to work with how I feel or what's happening to me. So unfortunately, when I did lose my leg, my, I did, I was not able to obtain healing and therapy through someone in which probably has to do with just me as an individual. I was able to obtain it through my activities. You ran the Chicago marathon in 2006 and you got the best marathon time for a female below knee amputation and you ran in a time of three hours and four minutes, which is just, what's going through your head when you're running, when you're in the zone, when you're out running a marathon, when you're running the 26.2 miles? For that marathon, um, it took me 10 years, literally 10 years to find the right prosthetic facility that had the talent to basically build the prosthetic leg that I needed to match up to my ability level. And and one thing I will go back and say, when when I woke up with a sense of realization after I had my accident and in the hospital, I remember laying in the bed and and I looked over at my dad, who I had not had a great relationship with just because, you know, everybody has a a story to go along with their childhood and just because of things that had happened between my mother and father I remember pulling away from him and I remember waking up that day in the hospital and I looked at him and I realized that I had got a second chance we as a family had got a second chance and I as an athlete had been given a second chance and I knew that from that day forward that I would always do my best and give my best because what I had been given was essentially a gift and not many of us get. So fast forward to the Chicago Marathon. Prior to that marathon, I was living my life, just kind of getting by day to day, not able to really achieve what I wanted to because I was being held back by you know pain, breakdown in my residual limb, technology, everything. Where I was at in my little hometown of Meadville, Pennsylvania, it just didn't have, um, we just didn't have the talent there. So I ended up driving eight hours to Long Island, New York, and found a step ahead prosthetics. That's essentially where I work now. I run the facility that we have here in Long Island, and I run the one that we have in Boston. And it was, I walked in the door and first words out of their mouth was, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do? Give me some goals. What do you want to do next? And one of my main goals was to run a hundred miles, but to run a hundred miles, you got to run the 26 first. So my second marathon back was the Chicago marathon. And I remember just, you know, just running, just enjoying the fact of living life. And looking at the people and smiling at the people. And I remember on the back of my shirt, it said, believe. So here I was, white tank top, 
you know, my Step Ahead logo on the front and on the back, it just said, believe. And as I was running, I want to say I was three or four miles into the race and a gentleman had came up on me and started running and pacing with me. And he said, you know, I was back there and I, I just was not feeling it. He goes, I was not feeling the marathon. I, w- I was struggling. I knew I wasn't going to reach my pace. He's like, and then all of a sudden there you ran past me and you had believe on your back. And so the two of us, he was kind of telling me his story. And so the two of us just stayed together and we stayed together with a, a group of other athletes. We stayed together and, you know, you could just tell he wasn't feeling it. And so what I would do is every time I came to an intersection where massive amounts of spectators would be, I would run and separate from our group. I would run out and take a very wide turn and throw up my arms. And when I would throw up my arms and try and egg the, um, encourage the crowd to cheer, they would all just start screaming and cheering and I would be jumping up and down and, you know, clapping and waving. And then I would run back into our group. And I said, for the gentleman that I met, I'm like, see, I'm like, they're all cheering for you. And you could just see with mile and mile of doing that, his, he just transformed. I was not even paying attention to what was going on because it was then my job to help him get through this marathon. And I remember we were probably mile 14, 15 or maybe mile 17. I can't remember now, but everybody, I kind of digressed off to the side because I needed a drink of water and everybody else kept running. And during this Chicago marathon, the weather temperatures had dropped into the thirties and the wind had picked up. It was 40, 50 mile an hour winds or something. And by me doing that, when I came back out, no matter how hard I ran, I could not catch back up to my group. And I just watched them kind of pull away from me. And I remember coming down the last three or four miles. And I remember I could barely even move my legs because it was so cold out. And I had shorts and a tank top that my muscles were essentially just froze. I was, it was everything that I could do just to make them move forward. And I remember coming down the last hundred meters and you know, my arms up in the air, just jumping and waving. I saw my, you know, family in the, in the waiting in the stands and everything and crossed the finish line. And as I crossed the finish line, that gentleman had been waiting there for me. And on his watch, his watch said two hours, 59 minutes and 45 seconds. And here to come find, um, he had found me and kind of did a Google search or whatever it was back in the day and found me. And I received an email back at the place where I work, the carbide factory. And it was an email of his story. And his story was the year before he had showed up to the marathon and just, again, wasn't feeling good. And he knew something was wrong. And so he actually pulled out of the marathon and he ended up being diagnosed with leukemia. He fought that battle. And in fighting that battle, he said that it was all he wanted to do was get back to the Chicago Marathon. And it was his goal to break three hours. So he beat the leukemia, got back to the marathon, and got to the starting line, started running. And he said he just didn't feel it. He knew he couldn't do it. And he knew that breaking three hours was not something that he was going to be able to do that year. And all of a sudden, this girl missing one of her legs ran by him with the words believe on the back of her shirt. And he saw that and grabbed a hold of that. And that girl pulled him along and kept him going and kept him positive and just did everything that she could to get him to the end. Crossed the finish line in two hours, 59 minutes and 45 seconds. So for me, that day had nothing to do with me. That day had to do with this person that I had met and helping him achieve his goals. 
you know, do I look back now and would it have been nice to maybe pay attention to where I was? Because if I would have just not goofed off as much, I would have broken that three hour mark. But if I had the opportunity to do it again, would I, would I do it differently to obtain that record that was below three hours? No, because what happened that day changed the lives of so many more individuals than just one person. And that's what my life is all about is making a difference in the lives of those around me because of what has happened to me. Yeah. So you walked into Step Ahead Prosthetics and, you know, you're speaking to the people there and they asked you what your goals are. And you said about wanting to run a hundred miles. Tell us more about, about that dream. So, you know, 2006, you've run this phenomenal marathon, changed lives, run 304, could have made it <laughs> sub three, <laughs> but you helped somebody else achieve their dream of, of going, um, going sub three. Well, when did you decide to go, right, I, I'm smashing marathons. I want to go, I want to go further. I want to go faster. I want to get to this hundred miler. What, what was the journey? So that journey was actually... Uh, a path that was taken due to the obstacles that we face in life. And all of the years prior to getting back to running, I was a welder. So I ended up in the heat treating department. And coincidentally, when I had my amputation, when I had went in to have my amputation, I had asked my boss, um, you know, is it okay? Can I go do this? Will I still have my job when I come back? And the answer was yes. So I went off and had my leg amputated, focused on the fact that my amputation was July 27th. And by August 5th, August 16th, I was standing at in front of my boss, ready to come back to work. And my boss had told me that my job was gone, that he had given it away. So for me, it was complete devastation because I didn't know, number one, what what was I going to do with my life? But number two, I was in such desperate need of insurance. And I said at that time, okay, um, I understand. Is there something else that I can do within the company? And I was told, yes, come back in a week. And for weeks after that, I would come back And coincidentally, my boss would be gone. I would come in one entrance and he would, he would leave the other entrance. And it wasn't until I went to pick up my permanent prosthetic that I had learned that my insurance had been terminated. So I wasn't even able to pick up my first prosthetic. Um, I had to pay for it. And after losing my job and losing my insurance, it was just kind of another obstacle that was placed ahead of me that I had to climb around, climb over, whatever it was, but surpass that devastation of something else one more time. And I remember working for a cleaning company just to obtain insurance. And from there, I ended up becoming a welder for the same company that terminated my job. And in doing the welding year after year and breathing in the fumes, combined with all of the surgical procedures that I had had, the intubation and the tubes that they would carefully place down your esophagus when you would go under anesthetics, the combination of the intubation and the chemicals from the welding had caused significant scar tissue to form in my esophagus. And what had happened is as the years moved on, the running that I was doing required more from your lungs um, and it created more scar tissue. So the combination of the surgeries, the chemicals from the fumes from welding and the demand that I was putting on my lungs created such scar tissue that I was unable to breathe running at the higher speeds that I was running. So when I was trying to run at six minute miles and the sub six or six minute mile pace that I was trying to run at, the 
it was taxing my lungs and my esophagus to such great lengths that I couldn't breathe anymore. So it wasn't even, it wasn't even a goal of mine. It was a goal, but it wasn't a goal of mine. It was a, a goal that had been forced upon me, I think much earlier than I wanted it to be. So it, I had to transfer from running marathons and half marathons and 10Ks to now run something that didn't tax my lungs as much. And so for me, it was, okay, now it's time to run a slower pace at a longer distance. And I remember just kind of falling into a profile where McDonald's had reached out to me and they said, you know, we're we're profiling mighty moms and we think you're a mighty mom. (laughs) So we want you to go out and do this race as a way to profile you for this series for McDonald's. And it was a Spartan, a Spartan race. And it was an obstacle race. I had never done one before. And I'm like, okay, whatever. My kids went and they had their friends going and somebody went and watched them while I did this crazy little obstacle race. And I remember trying to climb and jump with the prosthetic leg and climbing over everything, crossing the finish line. I was so excited, crossed the finish line. And as I crossed the finish line, I was given an entry to the death race. And I'm like, what the heck is this? And that amongst a couple other things was essentially the turning point into my long distance running. I remember a friend of mine told me a story of an athlete. He was the first athlete with a prosthetic to do an Ironman. And his name was Jim. And in hearing Jim's story, Jim became the first athlete to do an Ironman with a prosthetic. Jim had also lost his left leg below the knee to a motorcycle accident. But Jim's story went on to even greater lengths. Jim wanted to be the first athlete with a prosthetic to finish Western States, which was a hundred mile race out in California. And if anybody knows anything about Western States, Western States is basically the Boston marathon of all ultra marathons. Everybody wants to run Western States. It's one of the oldest and oldest, hard, hardest and most well-known ultra marathons out there. So Jim wanted to be the first with a prosthetic to do it. Jim went on to gain entry into the Western States 100 mile race, went out to the 100 mile race, started in Squaw Valley, got to 30 miles or so and had to drop from the race and told his wife and his crew members that it was the hardest thing that he had ever done. And he, no matter what, was gonna come back and obtain his dream of being the first to finish Western States. It was later that year, the following year, he was training for an Ironman and a cement truck got on a closed course. And when it got near him, just one of the, a freak of nature, the, the boom, the chute on the back of the cement truck came loose and it swung out and it killed him. And so when I heard this story, it was that story and it was Jim's goal of being the first that now had become my goal. It was my goal and my dream to now obtain this for him and his family. We then ended up going on to be the first athlete to qualify for Western States, qualified. And that year there was another athlete and coincidentally her name was Amy as well and we were both at the starting line with the goal of being the first athlete with a prosthetic to complete western states my goal was just for jim and i got to the starting line and i remember a day or two prior when i was in squaw valley um i got there only a couple days earlier and i remember meeting with the race director, he saw me as I was just walking through, you know, the Olympic Valley area. And he had said to me, are you going to have your crew members with you 
for the entire race. And I said to him, I said, um, and he said, my crew members and a pacer. And I remember saying to him, but is that what everybody else is doing? And he said, no, you know, the other athlete with a prosthetic, that's what they're doing. And I said, but what are the other athletes doing? And he said, oh, you're not allowed to have a pacer until mile 60. And I said, okay. I said, I'll meet my crew where they're allowed to go, just like everybody else. And I'll get my pacer at mile 60 where everybody else is allowed to get their pacer. Because for me, I wanted to do it as it was in the books, as it was officially listed out that you were supposed to do it. And I remember taking off from the starting point and heading up to Immigrants Pass. And that race was all about crossing the finish line for Jim. And we did. We crossed the finish line being the first athlete with a prosthetic to ever complete Western States. And I remember crossing the finish line. You know, there was a lot that transpired after that. And hopping on a plane that same day and then that following weekend driving to Connecticut with my little girl and presenting Jim's wife and his daughter with the belt buckle from Western States. Oh my God, you're going to have me in tears. <laughs> 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 oh, that's an incredible thing to do, not only for, for yourself, but also for Jim and, and his family. I mean, I can't imagine how that tied into your motivation to keep on running, you know, during this hugely challenging 100 mile race one of the things I'd love for you to to talk a little bit more about is is around pain running can can hurt like your body can be in pain and it's almost this battle between your mind and your body because of the pain that you have been through with regards to your regards to your accident regards to losing your leg do you think that's impacted on your pain thresholds or your ability to push through pain or to manage the pain? Um, so for me, I remember, oh my goodness, <laughs> that Western States race was preceded by the world championships in Brie, France, where I had made the U.S. 24-hour team. And I had made the 24-hour team uh, really caused a lot of damage to my residual limb. And then a month, month and a half later was at the starting line of Western States. So for me running Western States, I was not even 14 miles into it and was in tremendous amounts of pain in my residual limb, just because the bone kept wanting to push through the skin because of the previous trauma that I had done. And I can say, because people will always say, well, you don't have a left calf to cramp or you don't have a left foot to get blisters on. You know what? Trust me. I ran for 21 years with two feet, two legs, two sound side limbs. I know what it was like. I know what it was like to put my body through different things. I know what it was like to have blisters on both my feet. I know what it was like to have cramps in both my legs. I know what all of that was like. Having two real legs is so much better than wearing a prosthetic. Um, and I will, I will present that argument every day to anybody who tries to prove it wrong. So when I was out there running for Jim, the pain that I was experiencing in my prosthetic was tremendous, but I had a goal at hand and my goal was for someone else to help somebody else reach their dreams and their goals. Even if he wasn't here, it was to, it was to close that chapter for his family and it was all I could do to just take myself out of my head. For me, what I can do is I'll put my music on and I will literally go into the words of the music and it will be the words of the music that will allow me to pull myself from the pain. It will allow the pain to 
it, it's not gone, but it'll allow me to hide it or mask it. And so I will be, you know, headphones in deep into the words of a, of a song to help me get through. And I remember it was so funny. I mean, I thought it was funny. My friend thought it was funny too, but my pacer, Heather, um, I remember her yelling at me in the last mile and I couldn't understand what she was saying because prior to getting on the road for that last mile in the Western States run, I had said to her, I can't stand rocks. I can't stand trails. I don't ever want to see woods again. I never want to run on trails again. I hate this. This sucks. And I told her, I said, once we get to the road, I am putting my headphones in. I'm turning my music up loud and I'm just running. I'm pulling my hat down and running. And here, the entire, the entire Western States run, they had been radioing back basically to headquarters saying, you know, this is where the one athlete with the prosthetic is. She's here. She's made it through here. She's on her way here. And Tim Tweetmeyer, who is an ultra running legend and just phenomenal person, phenomenal athlete, phenomenal father, family member, you name it, just a, an all around amazing person was waiting at that last mile when we, when we exited the woods. And I was true to what I told my, my friend Heather, here I was hat down, music up, just running. It was all I could do. All I wanted to do was finish this race and be done. And I see Heather's hands like moving and I looked over at her and I'm like, what? I pull my headphone out. And I'm like, what? And she's like, I cannot believe you are ignoring Tim. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, I've waited all my life to be near this guy and talk to this guy. And he waited here to run with you this last mile and you're ignoring him. And, you know, I took my headphones off and lifted my hat up and, and realized just who I was in the presence of. And it was um, just surreal being with my pacer, Heather, who had given up her day from her family to be with me to help me achieve this goal and have Tim Tweetmeyer there running this last mile. And so the three of us, there we were, you know, side by side running, it, you know, it was almost surreal running to the finish line. And once I entered the Auburn track, you had to do one lap around the track. And we entered that that stadium and just everybody was on their feet cheering and screaming because all of them were also getting the play by play of where I was at amidst the race. And so all of them had also been a part of this journey to the finish line of this race. And, and I remember coming around the track and coming down that straightaway to that finish line, I crossed the finish line and, and Tim was there and we did uh, like an immediate cross the finish line interview. And once I took a, a few steps past and I remember walking, you know, trying to get through there and just walking, I needed to get my leg off and just needed to kind of collect myself. And it was at that point where I crossed the finish line, knew I was okay, knew I had done what I needed to do for Jim and his family. And then my entire body just collapsed and went into shock. So what I had done was ran and tuned out all the pain that I had been in. And once I crossed that finish line and, and the goal was achieved, my body just gave way. It, it went catonic of some, some type and all of my muscles, my legs and my arms completely drew back in and I dropped to the ground. And it was my crew members who carried me over to the med tent and laid there and just tried to get the rest of my body just to, to come out of like the spasm that it was in because of the pain that I had put myself through that entire, that entire race. So a lot of the time I'm able to pull myself away from the pain because of the goal ahead, because I'm doing it for somebody else. Um, and I know, you know, one of my friends, to this day. And a lot of people don't understand why I do what I do. And I just recently, um, and it's something that breaks my heart because of it, a friend of mine doesn't understand 
why I do what I do, doesn't understand why I put myself through the pain that I put myself through, um, and just can't understand it or can't just can't get a grip of it. And so a friend, you know, a close friend of mine had to literally disconnect our friendship because she can't wrap her head around it. And for me, this is what I know how to do. I know how to put my body into a certain situation to obtain something unfathomable. And because I can do that, it allows me to help other people. It does not make sense. My body is so unique and individual to itself. Um, you know, I can run without fluids, without fu- fuel, just because my body knows how to survive on nothing. But at the end of the day, it knows how to go through and to put itself through certain lengths and certain extremes to get to the finish line which then helps so many other people get to the starting line. And it doesn't mean get to the starting line of a race. It means get to the starting line of life, get to the starting line of overcoming something you didn't think that you could possibly do. Your body and and mind is phenomenal. Like just even just how you explain that. And then I'm I'm quite sort of like a visual person. And so I can picture you you doing this and it just Mm -hmm. it is beyond phenomenal like having that ability to push yourself and to stay that focused how do you recover from races like how long does it take your body to 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 bounce back so you that you can start sort of running again is that quite a quick process is it quite a long process you know how long does that take you for uh for me it's it's funny I don't do I really don't do a lot of body maintenance. I know people will see massage therapists and they'll do all kinds of, you know, different things to maintain the strength of their body and the rehabilitation and the healing of their body. Unfortunately, I don't have the lifestyle that presents those opportunities. I work full time. I'm actually working now. And I work anywhere from, you know, 60 to 70 hours per week. We, we have a, a combined, unique and joint little family that Christopher Accord and I have, where I have two children and he has four. So right now at our home, we have a, we just had an 18-year-old go off to the Marines. We have a 17-year-old who's a senior in high school. We have a 15-year-old <laughs> who's in 10th grade. We have a 10-year-old, and we have a 8-year-old who's just turning 9 years old today. So we have a large family. Um, we're very busy. And so body maintenance doesn't really have the time to rear its beautiful head. <laughs> in addition to, we have a great group of athletes that we meet with every morning at 515 create workouts and and as a team we all help them achieve their goals as well so in helping so many different people achieve their goals it doesn't leave a lot of maintenance time for me so one of the things that i do do is i take one supplement called beta alanine it was something that my father taught me so i would be the goofy little kid with the you know, giant glasses, you know, not the best equipment, but I would show up with little Tupperware containers of honey, molasses, and baking soda. So my father would would tell me what each one of these would be for and tell me how to implement it. And then I would use that later on in life. And I remember the time that, that I did run the marathon prior to my accident, I had my little baking soda pouch stuffed in my shorts. And when I crossed the finish line, I got a little cup of water and I would put the baking soda in the water and drink it essentially like a shot. And then I would drink water afterwards. And he told me I had to walk so many flights of stairs. And it was that education from when I was younger that's now applied to my athletic career later in life. 
And instead of taking baking soda, I found beta alanine. It's just a way of buffering the acids in your muscles to help you continue to endure and go farther and farther. So for me, when I'm doing these kind of crazy long races, and and I do a lot of death races and a lot of racing with Joe DeSena in Spartan and the peak races, I mean, the the death races and the peak races and Joe DeSena's it's kind of like a match made in heaven. Um, the stuff that he presents and puts out there, it gives me desire and drive to continue to do. Um, what, so when I'm out there in those races, it might be 72 hours that I'm competing without sleep. And I will take one of those beta alanine tablets every few hours and that is what helps me buffer the acids in my muscles as I'm competing. So when I get done, to be honest with you, do I hurt? Do I want to take time off? I would love to, but I can't. I don't have the luxury of doing that. So usually when I do a race, as soon as I cross the finish line, I'm either on the bus on the eight-hour drive back to the airport or on a 12-hour flight home or on an eight-hour drive home to then be at work the next day. I don't have the luxury of the body maintenance and taking the time off and recovering from a race of that magnitude. If, in which it happens most often than not, if I have too much damage to my residual limb, I'm fortunate that my everyday primary prosthetic is set up almost like a Cadillac. (laughs) So I can put that prosthetic on and really just relax and heal inside of it. Um, But no matter what, as, you know, a mother with a family, I don't have the luxury of taking time off. I have to be able to heal and recover as I continue my daily activities. And I can't take the time off from the athletes that I coach in the morning as well either. I have to be able to continue to do what I do and heal as I'm doing it. I mean, wow. And also to be honest with you, it's, I have to teach my kids. I have to teach my kids. I can't go and do certain things and, and not perform my daily requirements. I remember coming back from bad water and the skin in bad water is 135 miles in death Valley. You run from 300 feet below sea level to the highest point in the continental United States, Mount Whitney, 135 miles all the way going up 127 degrees. And I remember burning very large portions of my residual tissue off my leg. And when I took my prosthetic off, it peeled the skin off my leg. And I remember traveling back home. And this is a memory that will will last the test of time. I remember having my lawn mower, it was a push mower, standing there, hopping with one leg. My son comes running out of the house and he was like, suck it up, mom, turned back around, run back in the house to do what he was, you know, whatever he was working on as a little kid. And it's, it's things like that, that I hope by doing what I do, because I love being a mother. That's, you know, people will say, what's the greatest accomplishment? Or what's the greatest award you've ever received? 16, 15 world records, SB, Sullivan Award, none of that compares to my family, my children, and what they're doing and hopefully what they do in life is the greatest achievement ever. And I hope that the things that I do will allow them to be limitless. Oh my God, without a doubt, it will be. Amy, I'd love for you to be able to share just a little bit more around maybe your training. Like, um, do you work with a coach? Do you have a set training plan? Do you do it by feel? Are you using a heart rate monitor? Are you doing speed work, hills? Like, you've got a lot going on. Tell us a little bit more about how you manage to fit in the miles that you need to do in order to compete in these races at the level that you compete at. So, when my children were a little bit younger, I actually utilized them as part of my training. 
because I, so I'm, I was a single mother and I raised both Carson and Madeline all by myself, no support, no financial support their entire lives. And for me, it was always about playing both roles. I, I didn't want to be just a mom. I had to do things that a dad would do and a mom would do just to give my kids that well-rounded experience. And it would, it was always funny because there was always such a competition because they're so close in age. It would be mom, carry me. Okay, mom, if you're carrying me, you got to carry me too. So here I would be at night carrying both of them upstairs, or if we would always walk everywhere we went and I would have one on my shoulders and one on my side or one on my back. And so when they were younger, I utilized them as a way to train they would, both of them, they were so cute. They would get in, we called it the stroller coaster. It was a a double running stroller. And we would just run everywhere. And we would stop by McDonald's in the drive-thru. And then we would stop at the playground. So I would get my run in and they would be able to play and have snacks and do everything else. And as they got older, now that they're older, their sports have kind of led the way as far as our time and our life and stuff like that. So yesterday, for instance, a typical day would be um, yesterday. It happened to be a Saturday. So I coach a bunch of athletes Saturday morning at 7.30 a.m. We meet across the street in the on the football field. So we were up doing a part, partner workout where it was a partner and you had a buddy that was a wall ball. And your, you and your partner and your buddy – You were running with the ball ball, carrying the wall ball, doing burpees with it, throwing it, sit-ups with it, you name it. And when we do these workouts, I always try and focus on what everybody's individual needs are, what their goals are, and what they want to get out of the training that we do in the morning. So in addition to my training, I'm also helping them achieve their goals. And then yesterday, for instance, when we were done, I was off to the soccer field with one of the little guys, left the soccer field to then take my daughter to her lacrosse practice. And her lacrosse practice happened to be from 1030 to 12 o'clock. So while she was practicing, I threw my running leg on and I went out on an hour and a half run and came back. Of course, the ice cream man was still there. We were all so excited because we all had ice cream with sprinkles on it when we were done. And, and that, you know, essentially after that, I went to work and did work, did house stuff. And that was the end of my day. And now today I was up this morning, did a workout with the group of athletes that I work out with. And then we have a birthday party. So for me, it's just trying to figure it out and fit it in whenever I can. Um, I got home one of the days last week and took the little guys on a bicycle ride. They rode their bicycle and I would run beside them. We ran, got ice cream, came back home. So that allowed me to get some of a run in. Uh, One of the other days last week, my daughter had to do something for lacrosse. So I videotaped her little TikTok lacrosse movements that she had to do for her coach. And then she got on her bicycle. And I'll tell you what, she rode that sucker like a bat out of hell. (laughs) <laughs> she rode so fast and was like, mom, you got to keep up with me. And I was running literally out of breath the whole time, not sure how I was going to keep up with her, but she's like, come on, mom, you got this. And she essentially created my speed workout. So it's these little times with my family that we find is what allows me to train. So in the morning, 5 a.m. before I start work at 7 a.m., I'm up doing stuff. Do I have set a uh, set training regimen? No, I don't. Um, do I have coaching? No, I don't. Um, do I know I have something coming up that I need to fine tune my training a little bit more for? Yes, I do. So we are working with Guinness, the Guinness Book of World Records, and Spartan. Um, and Joe DeSena, we're going to be on his farm in Pittsfield, Vermont in November, setting the resetting the 100 mile treadmill record, followed by the 24 hour treadmill record. So I do know that as an athlete, 
um, in doing this once before that I do need to get time on the treadmill. Do you, do you have a treadmill at home? No, I have one at work. <laughs> so what I'll, what I'll try and do is uh, um, at the end of the day, instead of maybe if I get time to run on the roads, I'll run on the treadmill. Just because running on the treadmill is different with a prosthetic, because you, it's a different sense of a spatial awareness around you as far as the prosthetic hitting the front of the treadmill since you can't feel it in relation to where it is on your body. How many prosthetics do you have? I will say that can I do everything with one prosthetic? Absolutely. The only thing I can't do is wear high heels with my everyday prosthetic. Can I go out and do a 72-hour race with my everyday prosthesis? Yes, I can. And I do. All of my races that are 72 hours long, 60 hours long, they are all done on my primary prosthetic the one that I have for everyday use. When I go out, for instance, when I'm doing this treadmill record, I will wear a running prosthetic because what it does is it allows for the dispersion of shock. So when my real foot hits the ground, it's the bones in your foot, the muscles in your foot, in your calf, in your heel, everything absorbs and reduces the transfer of shock, trauma, rotational force. It reduces it as it goes up into your body. So by the time it hits your body, it's it's essentially gone. The prosthetic side, because you don't have any of that left, the shock from the ground goes right up into the end of your limb and transfers right into your body. I remember not really understanding this and not realizing the whole whole concept behind it until I saw the effects of it. One time it was, I was going into the 24 hour race, five hours into the race. I, my urine looked like beet juice and I couldn't understand why here, what had happened, the prosthetic foot had cycled itself out. It had no more shock absorption. So all of the trauma was going straight up and into my body, which went right into my internal organs. And so my internal organs were bleeding from inside. So as I ran for 24 hours, the, the trauma to my body, it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was intense. So for, we crossed the finish line of that race, the first female ever to win a race outright with a prosthetic. I ran 130 miles, 130.4 miles in 24 hours. I beat the first male by 15 miles and the first female by 36 miles. And needless to say, everybody was an able-bodied athlete. But what happened was the prosthetic foot wasn't absorbing any of the shock. So all the shock was transferred into my body. So if you have the ability to utilize a running prosthesis to negate the trauma that you transfer to your body, absolutely. So when I'm running these long races, I will use a running prosthesis. Can I do it with my primary leg? Yes, I can. But do I have a lot of prosthetics at home? I absolutely do. And if I look at my daily life, I really, I wear my primary one. It's so mechanical looking. I absolutely love it you know, kind of the old dog doesn't like the new tricks. I wear the same type of foot component that I've been wearing for 13 years. I do have a high heel leg that looks like a real leg. It's specifically for four inch high heels. It's absolutely beautiful. I have a leg that I can wear in the shower. I have a prosthesis that I can utilize on the bicycle. I have a prosthetic that I can wear flip flops with, then it has an adjustable ankle. And I have a prosthetic that I'll utilize in the mornings when I do my workout, more so like a CrossFit type platform-based workout. So I do have the opportunity to have multiple prosthetics, which I'm very fortunate. And I will say that those prosthetics, when you're an amputee, you have to fine-tune your body. You have to be very in tune with your body. So the more non-structured you are, the harder it is to wear a prosthetic. The more structured and fine-tuned you are, the easier it is. So my running prosthetic is 
is years old. My high heel prosthetic is probably seven years old. My prosthetic that has the adjustable ankle, I can't even tell you how old that is because I don't wear them very often, but I maintain a certain physique to allow me to utilize these prosthetics because my shape hasn't changed. Where would be the best place for people to be able to follow along with your running, with your challenges, with your adventures? Where can they go to find out more information? We have a website. It is www.seamyrun.com. So it's seamyrun.com. In addition to that, we are on Instagram. It's Amy BKW. But Amy, I'd love to, to leave you with the, you know, find a words of advice for, for other women out there who want to get into running, who want to push their limits, who want to take on something new and different. You know, what advice would you have for them? When it comes to any advice that I would like to give, and, and this, this is across the board for everybody, females, males, it doesn't matter your age, young, old whoever, whether you're an athlete, not, it doesn't matter. You always want to do and give your best. I understand that the world is a mess right now, but what you can control is what you do and what you do with it. And it is a choice. And at the end of the day, what counts is you and what's under your roof at night where you sleep. The rest of the rest of the world and the rest of the craziness that's going on, you focus on you and your family and focus on your goals and how you want to live your life. Because I know at the end of the day, if I turn around and I look back at my life, I want to be sure that I did my absolute, absolute best. I want to be sure that I gave my all. And so no matter what it is that you do, And no matter where you're at in life, if you always give your best effort, you'll never regret it. And if you give your best effort and push past, and I always say, if everybody can just push past where somebody else has put that limit, because there's so many limits out there, and that is what it's all about. Don't hold your standards to that. Take what you do and supersede it and go past it. So my words in in parting with everybody today is to always do and give your best and never settle for what someone else says is your limit. You have no clue where where you will go and what you will do in life if you just take that one extra step and push past. Find the happiness within you and just continue to do great things because There are no limits out there. The only limits we have are the ones that we set for ourselves. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Amy. What an absolute inspiration. My name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. Everything that we've talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check it out. New episodes of the Tough Girl podcast go live every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. UK time. Just want to share a couple of reviews which have been shared on iTunes. So a big thank you to Rebecca AXD, who wrote, honestly, who wrote this, honestly cannot believe I have gone five years without knowing this podcast existed. Thank you, Sarah, for the brilliant, inspiring and motivating episodes every week. It makes me so happy listening to adventurous women talk about their experiences and accomplishments and not have to be compared to male hosts, counterparts slash stories. This podcast really shines a light on an incredible community of like-minded women and it is the best motivation to push for my dream goals. Curly Campbell also wrote, um, This podcast has truly been a game changer for me. The tales of female adventures have made many running miles pass while I listen, smiling and feeling uplifted. It has sparked some ideas that will come to fruition. Well done, Sarah Williams. You have created something special here. 
truly thank you. And thank you both for taking the time to write a review because it is just me promoting and sharing the Tough Girl podcast to to everybody out there. So it really does make a massive difference if you can leave a five-star review on iTunes or the platform that you listen on, or if you could just tell one friend about the Tough Girl podcast. The reason I'm able to produce the Tough Girl podcast on such a regular and consistent basis is due to the financial support of patrons. If you would like to support the work that I do to increase the amount of female role models in the media, please do go and visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. You can support monthly, you can support annually, you can support in euros, sterling and US dollars, whatever works best for you. But every single patron does make a difference, pays it forward and helps with the mission. Please sign up and become a patron. I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. Take care, lots of love and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.